So welcome to the roundtable on open governance after all this uh, presentation. And uh, and okay, so we've heard several talks about uh, open source governance and just as many different perspectives on the topic. So we also had in the background of this presentation as many definitions of what an open source is. Um, so now we have a roundtable tasked with the challenge of bringing clarity to the topic. Uh, around the table, we have uh, Nejia Lanois. Nejia, as the CIO of the City of Paris since, 19, since 2012, uh, you lead the digital transformation of the French capital. You're an open source enthusiast and you believe in co-creation and open data to improve public services. Then we have uh, Chris Ilenius. Chris, uh, you're an international specialist on digital government and an expert on open source in public services. <laughs> uh, you lead the implementation of the open source responsible for the company's strategy and stewardship in open source communities. And then we have uh, Mike Milinkovic. Mike uh, need, does not need to be introduced. Uh, you're the executive director of the Eclipse Foundation since 2004, 2004. Um, and you know governance inside out as you lead both the Eclipse open source community and uh, its in commercial ecosystem. And Simon Phipps whom you've heard early in, this, in, early in the session. So Simon, you are the former head of open source at Sun Microsystems and a co-founder of the Java business at IBM. You now lead an open source strategy company advising an OSPO and on advising on OSPO and community matters, and you serve on various nonprofit boards. So thank you all uh, five of you for being here. And uh, and bearing with the with the tech, with the technicalities of this uh, live roundtable. So uh, this roundtable is the perfect setting for an announcement that we have been preparing. And as I just said at the end of my presentation, I announced that uh, European nonprofit associations organizations are teaming up to launch what we have called the OSPO Alliance. So we joined forces with leading European open source nonprofit organizations such as the Eclipse Foundation and Foundation for Public Code, plus the Open Forum Europe, to establish OP OSPO Alliance and create the OSPO Zone website. The mission of the OSPO Alliance is to grow awareness for open source in Europe and globally, and to promote the structured and professional management of open source by companies and administrations. So for OW2, the OSPO Alliance is a channel to disseminate the good governance initiative methodology that I've introduced earlier on, and to, to what well, this methodology is to implement OSPOs. But the OSPO Alliance is much more than that, has greater ambitions. And uh, maybe Mike, if you want to comment on the ambitions of the OSPO Alliance. Thank you for that excellent introduction, Cedric. Really appreciate it, and I uh, just want to call out again, uh, thank you for all the great work that you've done on the Good Governance Initiative. I think that's really helped uh, seed the content that we have uh, at OSPO Zone um, and, uh, and uh, helping us really kick off the OSPO Alliance with some, with some uh, really good content. Uh, so for the aspirations of the OSPO Alliance, I think it's most importantly, um, this is a global initiative uh, started in Europe. And so that is um, that is the the aspirations um, for this. It's not just about uh, helping tech companies build um, open source program offices. Um, as you mentioned, it's for corporations of all types, um, and in particular in the European ecosystem, you see a lot more sort of industrials and enterprises than you typically see in the pure software uh, giants um, in Silicon Valley. So there's definitely um, a somewhat different take on the role of an OSPO in those kinds of organizations. And I'm sure with the um, other panelists can talk about this far more than I, but in the role of public administrations and uh, the government adoption and contribution to open source, um, I think that's another very important focus area. I think, you know, taking from what you uh, did with the Good Governance Initiative, uh, one of the key messages that we want to bring to all of the organizations um, that are that are going to be engaging with uh, with the OSPO Alliance uh, is that is the importance of contribution and participation um, as well as use and compliance, uh, and so that's really going to be one of the the I think the key um, uh, focus areas for the OSPO Alliance is really helping the organizations that are starting their open source journeys 
uh, to understand and recognize the importance of participation and contribution. Um, and you know, the, one of my uh, all-time favorite presentation slides is, you know, open source is free, just like a puppy. <laughs> Um, and you know it's you know it takes care and feeding um, for to for to foster the open source communities that are delivering um, all of this important value and co-creation, collaboration, and innovation that's happening within the broader open source community. Um, and very much looking forward to uh, working with my colleagues and peers uh, in the OSPO Alliance um, to help further this mission. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Uh... Uh, Nejia, uh, over to you now. You're um, you're the uh, CIO of uh, the City of Paris, and the City of Paris has become pretty visible in the open source world lately. So um, maybe two things for, from you. Can you tell us what open source represents for the City of Paris, and also what you can expect from the OSPO Alliance? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, OW2 organization for having me today on this panel and for their work uh, ever, uh, ever since the city has been a member of the consortium. Uh, thank you, Cédric. So, uh, yes, open source software is extremely important to the city of Paris, uh, not only because it's um, efficient, more efficient, but also because it reflects our values and the values of the executive team. Uh, you're right, we, we are more visible uh, now because the city of Paris were, was more focused on uh, developing open source tools to achieve our digital objectives. But now uh, we are aware that it's necessary to promote our work and um, to promote our open source strategy and to share more with other organizations, cities, administrations. Uh, so open source strategy for, uh, is a real commitment. First of all, uh, it's a political commitment. And uh, here in Paris, open source uh, is uh, supported by the mayor, uh, the, the, deputy, the first deputy mayor, and uh, the team, all the executive team, and they uh, understand uh, its value and they sponsor its use. So we are very uh, uh, lucky for that. Uh, it's also a, a commitment from the ethical uh, point of view. We encourage uh, the, the, executive, uh, the, the executive team and um, uh, the IT department encourage sharing and reusing uh, all the work because it's paid with the public money and uh, we try to open uh, our source base uh, uh, and for us opening the source base is more than a technical matter it's also a matter of uh, ethical commitment and I think it's very important because if uh, when I discuss with the uh, uh, the other CIOs in other cities or administration, if uh, we don't have this commitment from the top management, it's uh, very, very difficult to, um, to, to, to promote uh, open source strategy. Mm -hmm. It's a responsibility for the CIO uh, because we can't say that it's uh, uh, the uh, fault of an editor if something is wrong, uh, something doesn't work. Uh, it's the responsibility of the CIO. Uh, it's also uh, using uh, open source is also for us cost effective, really. Uh, every time we launch, we launch a project, a big project, we have to compare the open source solution versus the proprietary solutions. Uh, we look at the return on investment and all the necessary requirements, uh, the deadline, the cost, etc. And uh, depending on the domain, uh, open source is often cost saving and keeps us an independent and it's very important. But we, we are aware that for um, special domains like financial or HR, we can't, um, we, we can't propose uh, open source solution because uh, they already exist on the market and we have to, uh, to use them. So you would agree, you would agree, Nigeria, that there is much more to OSPO managing open source than just managing compliance. 
it's a very uh, it's a complex uh, approach and uh, you it's need the, you need the support of the top management as well yes exactly That's very interesting yes it, Gis, uh, may, maybe because you're a big administration uh, uh, at the city of paris but i think and we come back to you nature but i think uh, the uh, european commission is even larger larger than, than that and uh, is it uh, um, you you do talk about establishing Ospo. And yeah. what what do you have? What do you put in that? Thank you, uh, Cedric. Well, first, uh, thanks OW2 for having us here. And um, I, I actually completely agree with what uh, Nigel just said. Um, for example, about the support of the um, of the leadership, it's essential. Without that, um, you can't get very far. This is something that I picked up when I was working for the Commission's Open Source Observatory. This is something that all the open source projects in all the member states would echo. But at the commission, you see it as well. And it's actually thanks to very solid support from the commissioner, the commissions, the commissioners, sorry, and the commission of digit, um, the director general and the directors for open source that we have a strongly established open source strategy that was announced last year. Um, the, to, to sum it up for, for people outside of the Commission, and I think Paris is actually bigger uh, in size uh, as a public service than the Commission is, but to sum it up, what the OSPO will try to do, what the OSPO is actually doing, is removing the organizational and the legal bottlenecks to open source that exist, that are currently making it difficult for the Commission to use more open source and are making it difficult for the Commission to share its solutions under an open source license. And I'm actually very happy to, uh, to sort of announce that we've made, in the short time that we're there, we've made some big steps. It's also because everybody wants these things to change. So it's now, it's now easier for Commission development projects to, to work on code basis of their colleagues. Previously, that was a bit cumbersome. We've changed that. Mm -hmm. um, but sometime this summer, it will become a lot easier for the Commission to share their uh, software solutions under an open source license. That's the biggest bottleneck. <clears throat> We've been working on it with a bunch of lawyers around the Commission uh, in sessions the past months, and we're, we're about to push this into the machine so that it will come out and then it will be a European thing. And then it will you know, that doesn't mean that the floodgates will open, but it will make sure that projects will start to trickle out of the Commission. And there's a Thanks. lot of projects out there, so mm -hmm. um, we hope that the community will be uh, using that. Yeah, so I see. I see. Thing, okay, so interesting, interesting to hear you say that Paris is probably a bigger administration than the European Commission. We usually see the European Commission as a rather big administration. But yes. Anyway, from the IT perspective, perhaps uh, Paris is uh, more... Uh, uh, I mean, they have a lot to do, and uh, they really yes. uh, develop their own services. And uh, I must say that we are very uh, actually we're blessed to be able to work with the city of Paris in, uh, in developing this methodology. They yeah. are they are really uh, very help helpful, uh, an example to follow. But maybe another example to follow, and we I'm looking at uh, Deborah Bryant here. Deb, uh, really, uh, after what you heard. Uh, you have first-hand experience from running what is probably one of the most influential OSPO in our industry, really. So, what what would be your uh, your your reaction to what you've heard, and uh, what would you expect from the OSPO Alliance? We can't hear you. We, we, you mute. First of all, we'll start yes. by unmuting, <laughs> which will help if we're doing a podcast. So, first yes. of all, thank you, Cedric, for in, in including me here uh, in the panel today. These wonderful uh, experts. Uh, my my initial reaction for the OSPO Alliance is a, a, a fantastic. A, a great deal of my work includes conferring with customers and other people in the industry that are uh, are struggling to find out how to adopt open source or to even develop their own program. I'm especially excited about this alliance because it's a cross-industry alliance. And I like to think of open source and, uh, and sustainable open source and useful open source uh, as an open ecosystem. So if you have a private sector, the public sector, nonprofits and academia adopting this kind of construct around using open source program offices, you know, small or large, to further their goals, 
in my experience, the, the challenges are not technical in, uh, in adoption. Uh, it, it, it has to do with, uh, with leadership and uh, resource and, and cultural change and then having an imagination to see where it can be used. So I see this as a, a highly beneficial alliance. And I can also see some potential. Uh, if you think about uh, an ecosystem that includes everything from a student learning skills to become part of industry or the public sector, uh, all the way through to companies that are innovating uh, through open source software and, uh, and contributing uh, to economic development. Uh, there may be a possibility in the future you'll find that this is a great uh, back fence, so to speak, to have discussions around what projects you're working on. You have to remember open source always starts with something and there may be other things that come out of the Alliance in the future that you had not even expected. But um, you you talk from the perspective of Red Hat, which is, uh, uh, I mean, Red Hat is entirely in the open source world, but uh, what sort of, and having established an OSPO, what sort of uh, advice would you give to the European Commission or to the city of Paris? Because they are uh, establishing this, they have to convince maybe some top management or they have to make room for the OSPO. Uh, is there any narrative that they have to build in order to have this OSPO uh, uh, more uh, uh, easily adopted by the, uh, the management and the rest of the organization? No, I can appreciate that. And I personally have worked in the public sector. So I have an appreciation for the concern about risk. Uh, people that work in the public sector are concerned about being stewards of public funding. And so uh, they, they take care not to misstep. But once they understand the, the, the benefit and the opportunities, and I think it becomes a matter of, uh, I mean, the good news is today, we have lots of examples of the successful deployment of open source. We also have a, a great number of uh, practicing open source program offices that are now producing material. And uh, you, you'll, you'll be a great example of you, as you start to populate uh, the resource. So I would say, you know, my advice is to look for case studies uh, that support what you're working on, to bring in your peers that have had a, a similar experiences and are managing the same risk that have been successful in that. Uh, there's safety in numbers and, and build a story according to that. And then bring people in from the outside. There's an expression, you can't be a prophet in your own land. Sometimes you need to have someone from outside your organization. I've actually spoken with other, uh, we've had teams go to other OSPOs because a leadership of a company may be, or an institution may be interested in hearing the advice of others. So that's a good practice too. Right, so I'll go back to our users, the European Commission and uh, the city of Paris. Uh, so you're, you're, you're bound to be establishing your OSPOs, not on your own, but uh, you uh, have to connect with other OSPOs. Uh, Nesha, uh, any, any perspective, any plan to connect with other OSPOs or engage with other cities? Or are we planning a, or maybe, maybe can we, should we plan a big city chapter in the OSPO Alliance? Go on, Reis, uh, what about uh, uh, the European Commission and connecting different OSPOs? I, sorry, we would welcome that very much. It's actually something we're already doing. Uh, we have, I can't say regular, we have quite regular meetings with uh, with other with colleagues in member states um, and beyond, where we where we try to get a a feel for how others are approaching um, the bottlenecks that that we see, how others are scaling their organizations. Um, we're sharing material with others. So, um, yeah, and th th this alliance th that you announced this morning, I think it's, it's, it's very welcome. And the Commission, I can say, at least the OSPO will be happy to work with them and introduce them where necessary, where relevant to, uh, to others in the Commission. Yeah, thanks. So, Mike or Simon, so what uh, <laughs> do you expect us to do? What should we do? What should we do for to facilitate uh, this uh, intercon not interconnection of OSPOs, but um, at least the sharing of experience between OSPOs in order to accelerate adoption? Uh, the first thing we need, I think, is a meeting place. And that's one of the things that I hope is going to happen at OSPO Zone as a result of the OSPO Alliance. Um, when we've been running, so we, OSPOs aren't a new idea. Um, mm. They've been uh, common in the uh, ICT industry for 20 years. <clears throat> uh, the reason they seem novel is there was never any way to find them. 
So uh, you always stumbled across them inside an enterprise once you started digging. And so I think it would be very important for the OSPO Alliance to create a venue for OSPOs to find each other uh, and to maybe be become a lending library for open source officers so that um, uh, organizations can borrow them for their internal summit meetings to share experiences. Uh, I, I think another thing that will be important is to find a safe way for people to share stories of failure. Um, the, 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 the most important lessons in OSPOs are not the, the successes that have been run through uh, legal and PR to put the company in a good light, but rather the disasters that no one ever finds out about. So, for example, I can tell you about one at Sun that we had because <laughs> uh, the company doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we, after having spent three years getting Sun's open source program office up and running, um, the uh, OEM division in Sun tried to create an alliance with the Santa Cruz brain, SCO. And um, we, we found out about this the day before it was announced and fortunately managed to get the CEO to, uh, to shut it down. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I love to share that story with OSPOs to try and help people understand that, it, you know, all the good governance initiatives in the world are no replacement for having the direct air cover from your chief executive uh, for the sorts of things that you're doing, because the sort of thing you're dealing with in an OSPO can be very critical to a business. They can lead to uh, to stop ship orders if you're a manufacturer. They can lead to uh, serious international level litigation if you get licensing and deployment matters wrong. And so you really do want to have air cover from your executives. So those would be the two things that I would do. I would I'd create a venue for you to find each other, and uh, I would create a safe way for organisations to share the dirty stories as well as the lovely clean ones. Okay, we'll do that. So that's OSPO Zone. So OSPO.zone will be the place. And Mike, so what should be our game plan? Because we've done, we've announced something now, but, uh, and we have uh, some content with the Good Governance Initiative, but now we need much more than that. So uh, tell us about the, the perspective, the OSPO Alliance within the next 12 months. So in addition to what Sami just said about, you know, touting our successes and, and sharing the failures, there's a lot of work that just has to happen, right? So um, I think, the, and that's sort of like the, 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 the bulk of the bell curve is, is really about helping everybody understand what are the best practices um, and what are the, uh, you know, where does the work go into uh, creating, making it easier to use and adopt, but also contribute and participate um, into the, uh, in, in, you know, into and via the OSPOs. So we're starting off with the, and this is sort of a question, uh, answer, partially an answer to a question that Christian Patterson just asked on the chat as well, which is, um, you know, we're starting this off with uh, the good work that uh, OW2 and Cedric have done with the Good Governance Initiative, but that's the starting point. Um, you know, be to to uh, you know, um, a mighty oak starts from a small acorn, um, and so the 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 plan here is is to grow and constantly grow through community engagement, a set of resources around best practices um, for the establishment and the ongoing management of OSPOs. Um, but in, but the OSPOs are really the, uh, a mechanism by which organizations as a whole um, engage with open source projects and open source communities. Um, you know, OSPOs are a means to an end. Um, and so the best practices that we want to promote um, through the OSPO Alliance and, and the OSPO Zone is a collection of resources to really help organizations engage with open source projects and open source communities um, on a worldwide basis. So that's I think that's really what the game plan is um, for the next little while. I think from a, for, from a call to action for uh, people that are uh, that are listening uh, to this and 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 are interested in, in doing more is become engaged. Um, this is ultimately a community uh, a community initiative and the resources that we want to collect are going to come from um, from you, the listeners, um, that we're going to, to <clears throat> allow us to build up the resource base um, that we want to provide to and share with, with everybody. So please come and sign the statement of support. Um, and But even more mm -hmm. importantly, um, 
participate with us and contribute content um, yes. for the OSPO zone. Yeah, definitely something I, w I can add to that is uh, we are, uh, there is a question about what's the difference between OSPO uh, Alliance and the Good Governance Initiative. Uh, you should look at the Good Governance Initiative as the methodology to implement an OSPO. But uh, that's what we do. We're just uh, developing this methodology. And I must say that we uh, have great help from the city of Paris as a beta tester and challenging us and making sure uh, that uh, it's uh, uh, what we all propose, which we try is reali realizable. So really uh, uh, much, much appreciated. But uh, then beyond that, there is all this interconnection and creating the network of all spores or putting people together in, as Simon Cher said, sharing experience or sharing fa failures and sharing resources. And so we expect resources. Nesha, can we hear you now? Uh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we, we can hear you. If you can comment. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we have started in Paris. Uh, we have started working with AW2 and uh, the good governance methodology to implement our uh, own OSPO as pilots. Uh, we are now in uh, the process of defining objectives and uh, how to implement them. Uh, we are very pleased to see the OW2 approach endorsed by other European organizations, uh, encouraging its use by more public administration because of, uh, it's probably more difficult in the public sector, I think. So we uh, regularly meet with uh, CIOs from other cities, European cities, but also French, uh, French ones. And uh, we are used to sharing our experience, but uh, the OSPO Alliance will bring a critical mass. We hope that the OSPO Alliance will bring a critical mass to this project <coughs> for sharing it with them. Um, other cities, as well as uh, learning from uh, from them. Uh, so I think a chapter, uh, a special chapter in the um, uh, uh, for cities is um, is interesting uh, for big cities, but also maybe for uh, uh, small cities because we all have the the same needs and uh, probably. Um, uh, the cities have a particularity. We have uh, a lot of um, business lines, Dimitri, um, and um, it's very different from uh, uh, public administration or um, a private company, which is uh, which are focused on one, two, three, maybe five businesses. Uh, in a city, even uh, in a small city, we have four. Uh, in Paris, we have four hundred businesses. So we have uh, 400 IT systems. So it's, um, I think it's a, a something very special. Uh, I worked in other sectors and when I came in city of Paris, I discovered this. Uh, so uh, we need to share uh, more for one need, for example, it, uh, it can be very uh, interesting to share with other cities. So yes, I think that it's um, uh, necessary to have uh, yeah. a chapter for the cities because of this uh, uh, particular aspect. But we also need to share with very different structures, uh, structures very different uh, uh, from us, uh, like the private sector or uh, international organization. Right. It, yeah, it's it's something that we've uh, discovered uh, trying to apply this uh, methodology is that uh, each situation is very uh, specific. So we have a top down methodology that is very abstract and then each organization has to customize it for uh, their own needs and all specifics. And for that, we may need some uh, uh, so, uh, we may well the ex experience. Nothing replaces actual experience. Uh, Deb, uh, you look at it from uh, from a from a certain distance, and plus uh, you are not a, a large end user, but more part of a, a large supplier. Um, so I don't know how um, uh, in how how is this resonates with your own uh, experience or expectations. And uh, and I was just thinking, uh, listening to uh, what was said, that uh, maybe we would need to set up an advisory board, and uh, you probably would be welcome in it. Well, thank you. 
Well, I think I'll go back to my comment about thinking about open sources and ecosystems. Although it is true that we're a large supplier, we're also a large participant in. And so for us, it's important for, uh, for every aspect of the, the, uh, the ecosystem, the industry to uh, do well. You know, we have, uh, in, in many cases, our customers are also the people we're working with in projects. And so we have a bit of a different relationship with open source. And all, all these aspects of, uh, of good governance, uh, good governance contributes to healthy communities. You know, there's certain, certain best practices that support healthy projects, you know, transparency and openness. There's roles for software foundations as contributors and consumers. There's roles in, in the public sector as consumers and also as contributors. And in many cases, we're seeing that growing. Really. So for me, it just makes a lot of sense to convene and share best practices. Although we have different perspectives from the seat we're in, but none of this is in isolation. And the less it is in isolation, the more we all benefit uh, to serve the, the purpose of whatever our, our role is. Great, thanks. So we are building critical mass in, uh, in sharing experience and uh, making sure that uh, uh, adopting open source, uh, will, well, we are building the state of the arts in what is, should be an OSPO. Now, I think we are getting short on time and it's uh, uh, time for, uh, well, Say closing remarks. I'll, I'll go in the order of my uh, of uh, what I see on my screen from uh, because we are on a GT uh, meeting actually here. Uh, starting with uh, Mike. Oh, uh, great! Uh, just want to say that uh, this is an exciting announcement. We're very uh, happy to be participating um, with our with our peers um, in Europe to launch this global initiative and. We're very excited to bring the community together to help document best practices for OSPOs. So uh, onwards and upwards. Thank you, Mike. Simon? Um, I'm very excited by um, the OSPO Alliance work, um, partly because it's actually open, so anybody can join in. And that way, uh, even the smallest organizations can uh, gain experience, use the materials, and uh, contribute their insights. And uh, secondly, because um, it's focused very much on a European approach, which has uh, smaller enterprises and has got um, a, a, a scale and a set of needs that are unique and are not currently being reflected in discussion about open source governance. So I very much welcome it. And I'm looking forward to joining in from the perspective of a smaller individual organization and a smaller enterprise. Yeah, there is no small, it's all about experience, really. Um, final words, uh, Ries. Well, I, I, I can only um, repeat my two previous speakers, the two previous speakers, the Commission, the OSPO, at least, welcomes this alliance. Uh, and I think it's safe to say that the Commission, with the help of the OSPO, will try to work in tandem with, with this and other industry associations across Europe to work with SMEs on open source. Thanks. Great, thanks. Uh, final remarks, Nezia. Oh, we are very excited to uh, participate to this uh, initiative and thank you very much. We are, going to, we are trying to, to have uh, more uh, members from the city communities, yes. uh, European ones, uh, mm. French ones, and maybe uh, uh, American ones uh, also. So uh, I expect uh, uh, a concrete work uh, which uh, can help us to to continue uh, the promotion of the open source and uh, sharing with uh, our uh, uh, the other cities and uh, the other administrations. Thanks. And uh, Deb, final well, words. I just want to congratulate the group that's launched the initiative and tell you we're looking forward. We'll be listening carefully to see where we can help to see where there may be gaps and, and to support the new alliance have Well, thank you. Yes, there's been a lot of work being being done, but uh, much more work remains to be to be done. So now we've had this session uh, celebrating and uh, the the OSPO Alliance and congratulating ourselves. Now it's time for real action and uh, uh, well, the proof of the pudding and all that. So uh, I think the next steps would be we will uh, uh, keep working on this and. Uh, 
uh, the, I think the next uh, stage for the OSPO Alliance uh, or the next meeting point will be uh, for the public at uh, the uh, open source experience uh, uh, event in Paris, I guess. And uh, I probably think that we will hear of the OSPO Alliance at uh, every, uh, each and every other um, <coughs> uh, open source industry conference uh, between now and the end of the year. So again, Mike Milinkovic, Simon Fifth, Nezia Lanois, Hissi Lenius and Deborah Bryant, thank you very much.